Sorry. Hey everyone, we forgot to start recording. Um, thankfully, we just started getting into this one, but um, sorry about uh, missing the beginning part. Uh, I'll, I will go back and I'll do an intro <laughs> and merge them together. So now it's going to be really weird because they're going to see this and then there was an intro. But anyway, for those of you guys here, never mind. Um, so where the hell was I? Sorry, I'm so confused. Um, what was I talking about? I'm lost. We're talking about the... Uh... Oh, I remember. Yeah, that 95% of the time, there's a better way to automate what you're trying to do, especially on a Windows computer, right? Especially if you're doing something in Excel or a, like a Windows-based program, you have a comm connection, or you can do a send message or a post message or DLL calls, or uh, there's so many ways that you can connect to programs that to me are superior and more reliable, uh, but often they'll take more time to to program. And this to me, so I'd, I'd say one of um, two ways I would use it. One is something quick and dirty. I just need something really quick that I can throw together. Um, or I don't mind if it's not perfectly reliable because it, you know what, it's, it's not a big deal if it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. But um, I don't wanna do any advanced programming. So this is, again, it's, it's a cool tool, I think it'll be helpful, but it's not meant to, to, to take over for doing something in a more elaborate way. Is that, how does that sound, Jackie? Um, yeah, sounds quite right. But, so I'm going to, I'm going to get off of this window here just because the, this is like an image shot of the program. Um, this is some of the actual code here. Let me go ahead and launch it. So this is the uh, automate my task. And basically you start out and you, you know, you capture what you want, an image of what you want. So I'm going to hit F1. And let's say I wanted to click like this calculator button here. So I'm gonna put it up here, I'm gonna hit F1 again to say that's where I want. Now, see the image right now in the middle of the screen where that calculator is? When I move it away, watch how the image changes color, right? That's because I was moused over it. And of course, when you interact with something, it changes the, the, the images and the pixels it's looking for. So you don't wanna leave your mouse there, you wanna move it away, and then I'm gonna hit F1 again. <clears throat> and now, this is what it's going to look for. And I can say display matches and look, there it is. It found the first one. If there was multiple of them, it would have found multiples. Actually, let me see if this will work. I haven't tried this. And once this is done blinking, here we go. So I'm going to use my little screen clipping tool and now I'm going to test it again. Let's see if it'll. I don't know what happened. That was weird. Test. Oh, and I, I, I hit test instead of display matches. Interesting. Well, <laughs> that, that is funny. So it didn't find this one, interesting enough, but it did find one here and one down here. Um, now, let's say I had wanted to, well, we'll leave the second one up. Let's say I wanted to click that second one. I can change the choose match to this one. And now let's, let's change it to move my mouse to it. And I'm going to test it. And notice it moved my mouse right over to here for me. Right. And another really cool thing I like about this tool over fine text, besides the fact that I can um, click things, you know, fine text finds it, but then you have to go in and write code to click it, right. Or to edit, send text to it or whatever. Um, I can do this. I can also layer steps. So let's say after I click that. Um, Joe. Yeah. Before you go into, to the steps, uh, if you remove the windows class, well, oh, uh, good call. Sorry, this one. Uh, yeah. This one. Th right. Does that then work I, I, for yeah. finding all three? Yeah, that's a really good question. Now, notice I hit the button and it's taking longer. And you're right. Good, good call, Jackie. Um, and it's it's a really good point to stop and explain a couple things. One was we opened it up and said, "Don't don't just look for this class." And I think the title was blank. Um, look everywhere. Now, when I did that it took a lot longer to find the images. And that's because I have three pretty big monitors. So it looked everywhere for it. Uh, fine text is built in to where, um, now let me go ahead and, and recapture this. I'm gonna hit uh, um, F5 is gonna tell me I can come back in here and let me, I can even do it off of here. Let's see what this does. F5 and move away and F5. And so now see this where it says window title screen clipping window and this auto window class is auto hotkey GUI, right? If we launched the WinSpy and move over this, 
we'd see that auto hotkey GUI, right? That's the class. And so it's using that. And the reason why this will be really fast, well, let's do display matches. If it does find it. Come on. None found, adjust your threshold. Oh, so this is where sometimes you gotta adjust the threshold a little. Hopefully it'll pick it up. This is one of those things that it's, it's you know, it's not perfect and there's, it's one of the things I know, Jackie, from talking to you that you didn't like about fine text was, and this doesn't document it either, right? Uh, but for whatever reason, oh, you know, no, that still should. Let's trim it down. The other thing I can do is I can say, let's let's just look for this instead of the whole thing. Interesting, I'm not sure why it's not finding it, but you know, this is the thing when you work with images, right? Let's try it one more time, move away, display matches. Huh. And like, could you, and that's just an idea, could you have a second uh, screen clipping window uh, running somewhere? Um, it's theoretical, but it, it would look in every one of them. It'll look in all of the, the classes. Um, and, okay. But let's, let's go ahead and let's get rid of this. Let's try that first. Oh, there it goes. Oh, and now, interesting. Oh, what? I'm, oh, wait a minute. Oh no, it did find it there. I don't understand how it found that. If it's saying auto hotkey GUI, this is not an auto hotkey GUI, yet it, it's finding it. So that's interesting. I'll have to ask Maestrith about that, of why why it was finding it there. Um, it still is finding it. Let's go ahead and say, well, choose match. The second one, it's a move. We're gonna test it. And it moved the mouse over to that one, right? So to reiterate, um, you can control what you're searching with by using like the title. You know, let's, let's bring up a different example here with, let's bring in sight. Um, that's an actual function call that we'll use, but we're gonna click this uh, and I'm gonna delete these steps. So you can do multi-steps. I'm gonna clear all the steps, that's fine. And let's go ahead and hit F1 to capture and let's do this search replace. Move away, there we go, display matches. Hey, there's just that one. Um, it's gonna be a left click, I'll test it. It'll bring that up. Um, now let's say I wanted to send a text to this form. Sorry, I'll let, I'll let Jackie answer the questions there because I know he can figure that out. Um, and we wanna send text to this box. So that's where we would do an F2 because we want to send text to something. So, oops, I gotta activate the window. F2, I'm gonna, what am I gonna look for? I'm gonna look for this find what kind of thing. You want something unique, right? Find what, move away. Oh, move away and press F2 to set the pixels. So now there, and then you wanna set the offset. So where do I want to click to send the text? So F2 again, I'm gonna display matches to see where that is. My offset notice is 66 to the right and one pixel up. So let's send Jackie, um, let's give this a test. Let's see if it works. So there we go. So I just automated finding that, but then when you find that, move over to the right, you know, and then send um, the word Jackie. And you can also say select all versus not. And this will, it'll try to click in there. If you don't have select all selected, it'll just click in there and paste but it, um, sometimes it'll append everything and sometimes you want the select all to be there so it will um, replace. You want it to highlight, it'll basically double click in there, select all, and then paste in the, the words you have. So hopefully that's making sense. Um, you, can, you can have it left click, middle click, right click, move. Uh, did I, I think I started talking about this. There's um, the left click is, sorry, uh, the actual click is far more reliable, but it, um, it it's just a little slower and it also takes the focus away from your computer, right? So the default, let's go ahead and get rid of, clear all the steps here. The default is to send a control click. So I'm gonna hit F1, I'm gonna do, oops, got a highlight thing, F1. Let's, we'll do the, the fine F1, F1. Now, because this doesn't say actual click, it's gonna send a control click. That's the built-in defaults. Um, first, I like to, I always like to display matches before, I, otherwise I'm wasting my time if I can't find it. Now I'm gonna test. 
Now notice my mouse is still here, right? It sent a control click there. Um, and Jackie, do you want to say anything about why control clicks are superior? What, any thoughts? Um, I'm not sure if they're superior, but they at least have their uses, right? But again, if, if you have something like, I, I, I'm not sure, maybe um, a canvas in a browser, that could be a game, could be something else, Silverlight, it could be uh, another application that doesn't really have controls. It could be, be a Java application or whatever. It might be some kind of old program. It might be a Citrix portal, might be whatever it could be, Putty. It could be a lot of different things where the control click might not be the solution you're looking for. But as long as it's pretty standard Windows programs, control click should work and is in a way superior because it's not really using your mouse it's not it's not necessarily changing your focus so if you're working on something or if the program doesn't need to be focused to take action that's yeah, and, that's that's a really good point Jackie and you're right it's it's not I shouldn't have said superior it it's it's context sensitive right in the sense of Sometimes it's superior if you're trying to do something, you know, that's when it's superior. If you're doing something else and this is running in the background, you know, on another screen and doing, taking action, then, then in that case, it would be, it'd be great if you could do that. Um, but if, hey, if you're not using your computer, then who cares, right? If it takes the moves, the mouse over and whatnot. So, yeah, uh, I tend to like to use control clicks just because, now, do you remember this? Does, for control clicks to work, does it have to be visible? Does the window have to be visible? No, it doesn't per se have to be visible, but it uh, it can, for the most part, be minimized. It could be in the background, can be behind other windows, and depending on your Windows version, it can be outside of the viewable area. Right. Yeah, yeah I remember you telling me you were doing, was it with the game stuff that you were playing yeah. with? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the more recent versions of Windows 10. They changed how the viewable area works. So before, when, when a window wasn't fully on your screen, it was still being drawn outside of the viewable area. But Windows apparently stopped that back in version 1809 or something like that. And, at the same time, they they added a more consistent uh, way of doing virtual desktops. So instead of having an unseen, rendable area outside of the viewport, you now have a virtual desktop that you can use to render stuff on. So, and we had a question in the chat if uh, if this this tool will work on windows that are you know hidden or behind other stuff, and no, it won't. However. I don't know, Jackie, if it was off screen, do you think it would work if the actual image was off screen? Again, it, uh, it depends on your version of Windows 10. Okay. If, if it's fully updated, it probably would not. And um, it can be made to work off screen, but it, it's a bit of a a change to to the core functionality from fine text but again that that's something that would be nice if you continuously use control clicks if what you're doing it in supports that and then if you changed the core of this to also work on on windows that ain't in front but then you wouldn't have these system-wide searches possible then how this tool is mostly working by narrowing down what window to click and search in. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and that's, that's what I wanted to, um, to stress is by tying it, especially to that class, right? More often than not, the classes aren't enormous. And if you're limiting this also, like in my syntax, you know, I can move this window around and it doesn't matter, it's still gonna work. And that's because it's identifying the class no matter where it is. And then it takes the index of where it is, where this is from wherever the bearing is and moves over to the right. So it's, it's very good in that sense of not having to worry that like you could, you know, you could automate clicking a button 
if you didn't move your program and you just all, auto, auto, always clicked that area. However, if you move a GUI, right, that breaks. And that's one thing I like about this is it's looking for certain things there and you can um, control for that you know, issue that sometimes things move around. I'm just reading the, um, yep. the chat. Uh, one is asking, does it continuous search? So does it keep searching? Or do a single search across the screen? Yeah, it's not a loop. If that's, I think is kind of, it looks, it looks where you've told it to look, like either it's under a given window title or a class once. Um, it does have built in, you can wait for a given window to exist, right? And you can say, hey, wait, wait for four seconds or 40 seconds or whatever for this window to exist. Once it exists, then go do your search, right? But it's not a loop. Now, here's the cool part, right? We've been demonstrating some stuff. Um, let's say we wanna, now we're ready to actually write our program. I'm gonna hit export. Now, let's put it back in the studio because it just looks a little better. Um, let me get rid of this. Now when I paste, this is the auto hotkey program that will go do that. Um, and Jackie just had me, we, we, it normally was broken out all the way across. And, and I think for dissecting what it's doing, it is easier to read it this way. But this is that same program now in auto hotkey code that then you can write your loop around, right? That's what I love about it is I export it. I don't plan to use it in this tool at all. This tool is simply to help write my auto hotkey syntax, right? And then it's easier to go in and say, okay, now put this in a loop or wait for this window to exist or whatever I want with it. Yeah, and you have chosen to here in the GUI to call the function AMT, and you couldn't have chosen anything else. Um, uh, you could have called it the entire name, automate my task, or whatever it might have been. Um, right, so that'll, that'll control it. Now, the default is AMT for automate my task, and I have put um, the AMT function in my function library, right? And if you haven't, and we can get into that too, but hopefully everyone here understands if that's in your library, you don't have to use it in your include. But if you don't have that function, let's say I get rid of this. Let me get rid of this guy. Oh, put that back in there. Um, and I'm going to export now because I didn't have just function calls. Now it has everything in here we need, right? This is the function AMT and what you need to, you know, to call the function. And I believe, Jackie, I hadn't actually had a chance to talk to, to Maestrith about it, but this is, he built this in here, so it'll get the active window and what you're doing, and then when you're done, it'll go back and reactivate the window. Is that how you make sense of that? Uh, I, I wasn't listening well enough, uh, might be the best <laughs> yeah. way of saying, because I was uh, writing in the chat here. Yeah. Um, what did you uh, say well, again, Joe? When you, when you export the program, he, he also built it in to where you first get the active title, um, and then I think he's restoring it. Is that right? Uh, in the next one, he's activating that window. So yeah, as you said yourself, he's restoring the window. Yeah. Now that obviously that's, you know, just depends on your need if you plan to use that or not. But um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty, pretty slick and will really help cranking out simple automations, um, even some advanced stuff. But again, because this drops it into a function, I can make some minor tweaks to if I want to. And then uh, I can write my auto hotkey code around it, right? So I don't have to spend all this time saying, go click here and do this or do that. Restore the window. Well, this up here before we launch the script, this is going to store into the this output variable called title. It's going to get the active program when you hit your hotkey in this case, or when you launch it. If I didn't have my hotkeys up here, which I do, um, it would store it in this variable called title. And then after it does whatever, it's going to go back and reactivate the program that was initially active when you started. Yeah. Do you, just to dissect kind of the function there, the AMT function? One, yeah, why don't you go ahead and, you know, that's it's your using area. a kinetic function call. It's just the parameters here are dynamic. As you can see here, it, it doesn't, do I have control, Joe? 
Let me let me pass. Not sure. I don't. I'm just not sure. There you go. Yeah, it's just here, as you can see here, it's it's using um, a dynamic amount of parameters. So so these parameters here are not spaced out or predefined. Um, so they can be kind of anything depending on how he's and it's it's um, Maestrith that has built this. So I'm not sure how he's doing it. If he's actually looking for oh yeah b win type type, uh, type. Equals, okay i'm hearing myself myself um i'd say he's doing as uh, as i'd hoped he's 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 here looking for the specific um parameters so he's not expecting the parameters to be something. Um, and that was kind of what I was getting to, Joe. Like, do you know, because it's kind of your tool, if I were to remove something like this, would it then default to a left click I, or yeah, would it know. fail? Yeah. I haven't studied it at all. Um, no, yeah. no. For to clarify also, right, the other GUI we were using, right, that's the bigger program. And then it exports this, whatever function you want. And that's what we're looking at here from lines 25 down to probably 120 or so, somewhere in there. Um, so it's a lot smaller than the thing that actually makes that GUI and does all the stuff, right? But this is what you'd have in your, your code library or in that file itself, depending if you're going to share it. Well, this is annoying. Let me do this thing. Um, but I, I honestly didn't. I haven't really studied until today. It's the first time I started looking at the actual code because I found a couple of minor bugs and was able to tweak a couple of them. Um, but I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, um, of course, uh, he probably hasn't built any kind of um, real error checking into it. Like your bits is B bits. So if you, for some reason, um didn't have this line here right then it would just fail miserably because right. it wouldn't ex expect that to be missing right and it's never checked if it's missing because why would it be missing right. um but yeah yeah so it's just a little extra thing it, it it was just like okay so if i just wanted to have something very short like yeah this, you know what it it, I think you it, you bring up a good point of when you're getting your function from a GUI tool that writes it for you, um, perhaps you don't need as much logic to, to check on certain things. You can assume that they're going to be there, right, um, for some things. But it's, it's a good point. Okay. Okay. Okay, Did someone have a okay. question or? Yeah, I was just reading. It, it seems someone asked about restoring the window, but you already answered that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, there we go. Okay, go ahead. I weren't really doing anything, so. Oh, well, did you want to look at any other thing else in here? I mean, there's nothing in here was, uh, okay, let me rephrase that. These these two things, and and I know at one point, Maesterth went and worked on redoing how. Do you remember who wrote fine text? It's the um, yeah, Fujitsu or something. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, he um he he had his method, and then I know Maesterth started going down the road of making his own. He did a lot. He spent a lot of time on it just because he was interested in it, how it was doing it. And uh, and if I remember correctly, these are even the uh, what's it called machine level code? I think that gets passed to to yep. look for certain things. Mm. Um, but um, then at some point, after a lot of thought, he's like, you know, I think is it Feiyu? Is that, I think was, he he was onto something. He's like, I think he might have reverted back. I need to ask him because if this is the other code, I want to give them credit for you know for that. But I know make sure to work through the whole thing entirely till he completely understood it. But um, that is the one that to me, I'm like, he started, Maestrith was explaining it to me and I'm like, yeah, 
you know it's 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 so comical for me i'm like uh, okay um way too advanced for me but the rest of stuff was was is pretty simple did anyone have any other questions on it in and, and here's the thing we can have more questions on this um and if there's none specifically on this at least not right now we if you brought your own stuff anyone wants some to work on anything that they're doing um we can switch over to that and then maybe come back to this or not i mean it's something we can definitely talk about but i didn't want it to take up the whole webinar it was just it was a cool thing i wanted to release um and, and let people start using and give me feedback on what they like and don't like as well and what's broken oh um, you know i did watch your youtube on it and i was i was confused as well about why it wasn't finding that same s on the same row i think a little bug testing might want to be done around that make sure it's still working on the same you know exact row i i honestly don't remember <laughs> what you're talking about but I oh well, because you, 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 you tried to do a fine text on uh or you, or this on uh an s in the command prompt and it for some reason wasn't finding an s you think would work yeah, but you had three lines of the same piece of uh, comment in in Saturday, and it it you took the S on the end of the line and made a copy of that, and then you tested it and expected it to find all the S's in the text, uh -huh. but it wasn't. And without knowing for sure, because I saw the same thing, I was also like, that's kind of weird. But well, maybe, it looks like it found out in the same row there. So yeah, yeah to me that's bug tested. My my guess is that the other S's, the prior S's on those lines in yeah, the video. Yeah, slightly different in some way. Yeah, yeah. Just because they are not after a D or whatever, because this S is before a Z and the next S is also before a Z. So who knows? Is it is it just because depending on where in the GUI the Thing is rendered. Okay, well, that's giving here, a little oh, bit more oh, consistent results. Well. Yeah. But I think it's really cool how this is, you know, highlighting it on the screen. The, oh. By my understanding, fine text doesn't do that. No, no, it doesn't. Um, it also, yeah, especially the index number. Now, this goes up to 100, so it'll find up to 100. And that was just. Oh, just, yeah, they're labeled. That's cool. Yeah, we wanted to truncate it. But the other one that I, I told Maestro that I wanted to do was when you're configuring an offset was I wanted to be able to, hey, set the offset, but I wanna have a button here that says, display where the offset's gonna click. Um, and that, and just put a dot where it's gonna be. And I think that'll be helpful as well to say, oh, cause when I was doing, I was practicing with site with these search replace things. And um, it, it was, this was, it was pretty finicky on where I had to click in here. And the problem was, I could see this one, but I couldn't see the offset of where I was clicking. And so I want to have a visual dot to kind of help me understand where it is here. Do I need to change the offset up or down? Um, that's another one I thought about. That reminds People, me of so much auto hotkey is like trial by error and you're just cutting out one step of that trial by error helps a lot. We, we have a few posts in the chat here. Uh, one guy is saying, that's Ryan. Uh, I think you guys did a great job. Uh, hard to know where to draw the line with this. Yeah. Um, you could write a function to run loops to iterate over pages exceptionally, except, exceptionally, nah, apparently, with a common yeah. URL, URL syntax. Okay, I'm having a hard time of pronouncing stuff today. Um, but no page nation. Mm. Apparently. Imagination. Yeah. yeah. And even write a function to save the content and then make a cup of course coffee. Of course he was <laughs> right. But again, that was one of the things that Joe started by saying is that for the most part, you could probably do that with more reliable code. Not that this is unreliable code, but again, we talked about if you wanted to do it in the background, if you wanted to do it with more speed, doing something with calm or maybe in, in the IE browser or the calm library, or maybe even with our uh, TTP requests, depending on your need, right? There's a lot of methods of doing a lot of things, but this is the quick and dirty way. And uh, Nicholas also says, I have a question about libraries. 
is there a standard library to add? And that <laughs> it's kind of had hard to answer because I'm reading it in two ways. There is uh, there are some standard locations to add libraries, but there's also an attempt on the forum at one point to create something that you should probably have in your standard library. But there is no official standard library need. There's nothing right. that you do absolutely need to have in your standard library. It's fully up to you. Yeah, as Jackie alluded to, and I and I know we actually covered this in a couple of webinars, and I've covered it in like functions and stuff using include commands. Uh, but you know, auto hockey, as Jackie mentioned, looks in at least four. Right? There's the the active running instance of your executable and an lib folder under that. That's the main one that I store everything in. And that's just a preference, right? It, it, any of these are fine. There's under your my documents where auto hockey. There's a folder for auto hockey there and an lib folder there. In the local directory where it is, there's an lib folder there. And I thought, does it also look in the uh, in actual the running the the right, same sorry. folder? Sorry, what was that? Uh, I do, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, should do that. Yeah. Um, um, I have in here. Um, I have 98 functions I've shoved into my library now, and I even have a here no longer used where I moved another 99 of them that I just realized I had so many in there and I just don't use a lot of them. So I don't want to lose them entirely, but um, you know, I, I have a lot. These are ones I like to have access in any programming thing I'm doing. I like to have access to them. So I shove them in here. And then the great thing about studios, if you use an include command, like if I, um, if I put up here and put include, oops, wrong character. XL, so that's my Excel library now, and I'm gonna, um, let me do Control T, oh, not Control T, Alt T. So that'll relaunch Studio um, to make sure. Now, when I start typing XL and underscore, and of course it doesn't work. Come on. And have you ever had uh, libraries conflict with each other? Here we go, So, so now, my, this is all stuff from my Excel library because everything, and that's another one that gets more complicated, but um, everything that's in my Excel file in that library is here and I can hit it and then notice it even starts giving me studio brings in the parameters for it stuff. Um, to your question, Sean, I haven't, the, the, you know, the problem I've had and, and maybe someone can confirm this with me is um, if you have a local version, like if we exported AMT, into a script right here in this window, um, even though I still have it in my library, it will run and it will use the one in this file without a problem. However, if I change one character in this file, um, then it seems like it realizes those two files are out of sync or something with that and that it'll say there's multiple instances of AMT and which one, you know, you need to deal with it. Yes, unfortunate. Yeah, so it, it uh, you do have to give it some thought. Um, the other, yeah, the, the, uh, that, the thing that Jackie mentioned, I see Mason discussing now is there's, there are some uh, links um, that have a, a ton of libraries. Um, and that's honestly where I've found a lot of the stuff that I use is just by looking online and seeing stuff and and then, of course, whether you put it in your library. Now, now let me let me really scare you. Um, if I go to this, this is my working folder in Auto Hotkey, right? So here's things I've worked on, and then under HK functionality, here are other things I've worked on that are much more kind of built into Auto Hotkey. These aren't in my library, right? These are things I know I've worked on. I keep them handy in case I ever have to resort to them but they're not things I put in my library. The stuff I put in my library are things that I want to have access to later on a given script. Like hopefully, you know, automate my task kind of thing. Yeah, and, and it, it is um, very dependent on the different auto hotkey user. And there is not a per se must have, um, but there is of course, what's it called? The awesome list or something? 
think it's on GitHub, or or at least it's linked some. Oh, it's it's on the chat actually. Fair enough. So someone has already posted about it. So so on on GitHub at least someone posted the link in the chat, and I'm pretty sure that you can find it otherwhere. That's What's that's that's the hot key uh, GitHub. Um, okay, that's not very, um, um, But there's talk? also the no one one more. Oh, there we there's go. There's the the awesome on hotkey libraries. And it's just a collection of people who have kind of voted different uh, hotkey right. libraries and stuff in that could be uh, a good go-to page when just wanting to get something that others have kind of vetted. Might well, be and here's the thing, right, is, is uh, obviously everyone, everybody I know, I mean, one of the reasons why Jackie and I started talking, I don't know, what, four or five years ago now, whatever, was him and I work in very similar areas. And he was like a year or two ahead of me. So he helped me all the time. He, he, he was answering questions all the time in the forum that I had because we were very similar in what we were doing. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we started talking a lot. But, you know, people, other people do do things so differently, right? So my point is when you read this, you know, realize it's, look at it for the stuff that you use it for because I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's so much stuff I've never touched, right. That it auto hockey does. And I'm like, I just, all the image manipulation stuff that, that I know and even GUIs and I'm like, I just, I don't really make GUIs. I don't personally usually, you know, work with them. And even though it's great and awesome, but it's just not something I do. I think somewhere in there, there was also, what's the status of the auto hockey conference? Yeah, um, we we you know we didn't get a lot of interest of total in it. Um, I mean, I'm happy to to have it here in Dallas, and people can come stay at my house. You know, <laughs> uh, trying to we we were trying to do something in Vegas and just see, and you know, it just gets back to it's a lot of work, and we're all busy. Um, I've been trying to to uh, uh, meet people locally or meet online and, and talk, but um, I'd love to be able to get together, but. It's uh yeah, bring your own mask, no doubt. Um, yeah, uh, it's it, for now until we get, you, you know, and, and Jackie and I did one a, a podcast. I don't know if we've released it yet, actually, Jackie, but we were talking about do we need to does Auto Hotkey need to get together and build tools? And I'm I'm, I'm going to say like this fine text or automate my tasking. Not that that's it, but just concept wise, build some really cool tools that will get businesses interested enough, interested enough to start using auto hotkey in their workplace. And if we build enough cool tools, suddenly employers will really start caring about it. And then I think we can actually have a, you know, a convention or something and get people together. Yeah. I would say that's, that's probably what was done with uh, blue prism automate anywhere. Uh, you are, are just pretty good tools build in some language, whichever it is, C or C++ or C Sharp or whatever, they build those tools in. They're not in themselves anything other than what Hotkey is. It's an automation tool built with C++. Uh, and RPA tools are just automation tools built in some language. You know, and actually, Jackie, trying to laugh, but um. The reason why I ended up releasing Automate My Text was because we did that podcast. Not that I still thought it was it, but it just reminded me, because we were talking about it in the podcast, look, the, as much as you and I both dislike it, for lack of a better term, um, Automate It and Blue Prism stuff, they all have these gooey interfaces, and that's what is, is apparently, you know, the businesses, they don't want to teach people anything too complex, and so they want to have a drag-and-drop gooey interface um, and I do like, even though the automate my, I don't necessarily love the automate my task, but you know, I have a web scraping syntax writer. I have an API syntax writer. Um, I'm going to hopefully at some point work on one for Excel, uh, because I love not having to type out all the syntax, right? I do love having a GUI that will write my syntax. I just still want to have the syntax available because the flexibility it allows for goes way beyond any type of GUI or even 
recreating a loop in a GUI just to me it's it's clunky right yeah clunky. yeah i don't remember if we made it into a thing where we had um, the talk with tank who has actually worked with quite a few of these uh, rpa tools um and as he said yeah it's it's fine it's it's a gui interface it's drag and drop but the operator actually ends up needing to learn the ten text of that tool anyway because yeah they're they're pretty straightforward but in the end, you still need to tweak uh, the syntax from time to time. And because of that, he was so much uh, into just keep using something like Autohotkey. It's an open source free tool that has the same power. It just doesn't have the same paid team behind it, which is what really differentiates out of hotkey to a tool and other API or RPA tools, just because you don't have priority of support, you don't have um, team uh, educators that will come out to your workplace or whatever it might be. And that's just because someone was smart enough to make it into a pretty useful tool and done sell, 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 right? It's, it's what it is. Right. Um, I was reading Robert's comments um, and, and, you know, I've been using AutoHotKey for like 10 years and I still, uh, to some degree, consider myself a noob at certain things I'm doing with it. So, yeah, there's that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to Maester today because we were on a call with a friend who's, who's on this call right now discussing objects and going over objects. And um, Later, I, I went, when I was talking to Maestrith again, I'm like, hey, by the way, you know, thank you for that. He got a lot of it, you know, and I said I was able to, to um, help him a little more myself because I've been, you know, talking to you. And, and I said, but, you know, it's a lot to learn when you're learning objects and arrays in your first time. And what blew me away, but it's just one of those things, right? Maestrith said, he's like, you know, I had a really hard time understanding objects when I first started using them. And it's one of those things, of course, I met him, you know, he's spent years programming in auto hockey. I like everyone else I know. He's not a programmer yet. He, uh, he does really advanced stuff now, but that's just because he's ahead of the curve, right? He dove in really deep years ago and he, and, and I catch up to him now and work with him and he does stuff and I, I, you know, get my eyes crossed, but he even said for him when he first started learning him that he had a really hard time. It's, it's one of the things everyone does. Right. And now I can start looking like the, um, the function this exports out to when you flatten it out, I can read it just fine, you know, going across and think of it as an object and key value pairs. And it's, and it's super easy for me yet. When I first started doing it, I, there was no way I could have followed that. Yeah. And, and people in the chat are still talking about where, where is the future of the language going? And we have had a podcast about that and we've talked about it in some webinars before. And and of course we don't know. And uh, our hard key is again. There's there's not much money to be had. So it's it's on people's leisure time that they're doing stuff. And um, you can probably get some small paid job, but getting some kind of full time job with your our hard key skill alone is gonna be hard. Um, and Ectcos, who is at least the main developer has at least had ups and downs with how much he wanted wants to do with the language. And some of it probably also has to do with, is it a challenge? Is it something that interests him? This is quite a powerful scripting tool already. What, what more functionality do people uh, wish for it to have? You can pretty much write uh, not everything, but you can write most stuff for Windows. Whatever task you think you want to automate, it's, it's pretty much doable. So what does our hotkey lack? Mm. It's, it's not usable on other OSs, not really at least. So it's, it's bound to Windows and Windows is probably not going away just yet. But is it good on a server? Mm, you can do some auto hotkey stuff on servers, but you're probably not gonna be 
making any kind of a web API in AutoHotKey, not per se, that would be for another tool. And, and it goes on. It is meant for desktop automation, but that desktop automation can be really, really powerful. And that's why we are comparing it to RPA tools because that's what it's most easily comparable to. It's, it's not, it doesn't have the amount of developers and, and backbone or whatever you would call it as Python, but not because it's less powerful than Python in essence. Python has just had more people work on it. So it has gotten to a point where it's outside of a comparison straight up at least. You simply just have too many people who have done stuff with Python to really compare them now. The um, communities are so different. And uh, I think I just rambled on there. I'm not sure I'm still on point, but yeah. No, I mean, it, it is, uh, um, I was trying to find, uh, and I posted a link to at least to the overall podcast, this 14th one, the historical version. Now, unfortunately, this is not the right link. Um, I wanted to, the you know, remember the image in that one that we did, Jack? Actually, you know, I could do is go to the, the video and then let me mute it. And he wanted to implement. And we'll go ahead and pause it too. But um, we were discussing the different versions and the flow. And it was, a, I thought it was a really fun podcast because we talked about the changes in it over time. Um, we also had a, a webinar with, uh, what's his name? Hotkey, right? Is that it? Yeah. That did uh, Auto Hotkey H. Um, and uh, that was interesting. But um, yeah, I totally agree. Auto Hotkey, it's, it's amazing. And it, uh, it does a lot now, especially real programmers will complain about some nuances. But here's the thing. You know what? Someone tell me one language where people don't complain to some degree about them, right? I mean, everyone yeah. has their nuances. Or every language has this and that that people don't like. Um, it's, it's folly to think there's one perfect one. Um, Python's a very easy one to pick up. It, it has some cool things. I've learned a little bit with it. But it, uh, it ha it, it's, uh, you know, there's some complaints I could easily vent about it as well. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say depending on people's level and where they want to go with it, um, one of the things that I've heard multiple times before is use the right tool for the task. And right. at some point, AutoHotKey might not be the tool for the task anymore. Uh, if you want to move outside of Windows, then AutoHotKey is probably not the tool for it anymore. <laughs> then you yeah. might need to learn a language that can automate stuff in Android, or if you want to make an app, something that can make that. And so on and so forth. There's definitely things that you need to learn if you want to do stuff online, JavaScript, PHP, and so on and so forth. So it, it really does depend on where you want to move from what AutoHotKey can do, as it can do most things on Windows. That's probably the future of AutoHotKey is to stay on Windows, doing most things on Windows. And depending on what Microsoft <laughs> chooses to do with native apps and, and I don't know what, maybe we will have developers able to um, help AutoHotKey into that. Maybe we won't, that's really hard to say. It, we're kind of low on top end developers from my perspective, but I don't have the right insight to really know. I, I wouldn't be able to really add anything to our hard key in C++. Lexicos normally has it. I can see on the GitHub that a few people are helping him, but what's their interest? A hot key it has made our hot key H and is at least still updating that to some degree. So, so that's two forks that are actually really developed about a hotkey and where it will move on from there. Someone with the interest or the whatever might make a new fork in, in the future that yeah, I, will move our hotkey into something new. I saw the question earlier about could a, you know, a person or a group of people create a, you know, a tool that 
basically gets some notoriety around auto hotkey kind of thing, right? Um, and, and here's, and it, it, I, I would also say it, it gets addressed in what you just brought up of where people that work with auto hockey, where are they spending their time and what they're interested in. And here's the thing that, I, you know, I've, I have all those interviews I did with, I don't remember how many, like maybe 30 people that use auto hotkey and talk to them about how they use it. The one thing we all had in common was we all love getting stuff done quickly and efficiently. And you know what? Making a GUI, the GUI tool like I just did, it, it's not something that we want to do, right? Because it's that's not our favorite approach. We know there are better ways. And yet that's the thing that made Blue Prism and Automation Anywhere and stuff, you know, notable. Um, so it, the question is, how do we how do we change our mindset to say slower could be better, right? Or clunkier could be better because we get it adopted um, and then we could have more people you know, working in auto hockey, doing even, because I would love, um, I was talking to Tank the other day, you know, I saw, what was, what was on Power Automate, Jackie? I think I, I sent and asked if you had used it, but it, um, it had some injuring stuff in it. And then, uh, but then they switched over to like loading forms and it has AI that can look at a PDF and let's say it looks at five of them and recognize oh, here's the things that are staying the same. Here's the things that are changing. This is stuff they want to capture. And then la automating, labeling, doing the stuff and processing them and using the AI. And I'm like, good Lord, I would love to have that in auto hotkey, right? I, I would eat that up in a heartbeat. Um, it sounds like there's some APIs we could probably use and connect to, but we don't have that intuitively in auto hotkey code that I'm aware of. I haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, but um, with, with auto hotkey, you have quite a few amounts. Of, you have... One tool that we often, or at least mention from time to time, is uh, Pudor's Macro Creator. Um, doesn't seem like at least someone was asking if AutoHotKey could be used to make something like Blue Prism and UiPath. And that's the closest we get uh, currently to something like it. And when looking at uh, how UiPath, as an example, works, uh, I, I saw an example at my work recently, and they get a remote desktop, so it's, it's just a computer in the cloud, fully Windows installation, and then they automate the task on that, and then the bot has that computer to do the task whenever it's told to do it. And there, there's no real um, magic behind that. It, it's it's just a RPA computer, remote desktop computer that's running an RPA bot on itself. So there's no user to disturb it. And our hotkey could do the exact same thing. There's, there's no, they don't really have anything that's moving them away from being able to do the same thing without a hotkey. We looked at it a bit and some of them had made some better, um, just like you do here with your uh, automate my task, Joe, uh, it, it sends a left click. Some of those uh, RPA tools might look at, um, what was it, the, the UIA. So the other way that Windows programs can be built that is not controlled, but, um, that's okay. one way to to build something, and we'd have a few developers in in Autohotkey that tried to move down that path, but it's none of it really comes to any kind of maturity where you end up saying, "Oh, this is the definitive," and then people build on it. Most people in Autohotkey stay for a set amount of time the people who want to become programmers or have other things to do, they move on. And then the rest of us, we keep using those libraries that others have made and how much we tweak them, how much we extend them. That's, that's hard to say, but um, it, it kind of happens in, in sentiments like we had with Malkov that made this stuff for the OCR that's built into windows. And he made a separate library that's facial recognition that's also built into Windows. And it's just a matter of building the correct Dell calls, finding the 
Come GUI IDs and and stuff like that to to build those tools, and to be able to do that, you need people with a specific level of coding knowledge, whatever you would call that. And I, I probably couldn't do the exact same thing as these guys are doing. So uh, at the top, we're probably lacking people to move on with stuff like that. Well, you know, and part of the conundrum is the confusion around making money with AutoHotKey, right? And, and well, at least that's what that's what people think is, well, oh, Chris Mallet didn't want people to make money with AutoHotKey. No, that's that's not what he was saying. You know, it was he didn't want the uh, code source type thing, the syst the auto hockey itself to be a for profit thing. Is that a better summary, Jackie? Of yeah, it's probably a good way of putting it. He didn't want the auto hotkey web page to have ads. He didn't want the auto hotkey interpreter to in any way force you to pay for it. That's why it's open source. But you're fully allowed to make scripts in auto hotkey and charge people for using them. You can do that just fine. You can charge people for your time on writing auto hotkey stuff or whatever. That's that's fully allowed within the license. That's there's no limit on making money without a hotkey as long as you don't um, hide the auto hotkey source and try to in any way obscure that it's auto hotkey might be a way of putting. But it, I think it still just gets back to um, unlike in other languages, right? There's this conception amongst a lot of people that if you you know if you talk at all about making money without a hotkey on the forum, some people, you know, let's say frown upon you for a, a lack of stronger way to say it. And I think it's one of those things by being able to make money, you uh, you incentivize people to do more stuff, right? And you keep people using it. And that's, I wish we would get around that. And I know, Jackie, we've talked about this, the whole stop thinking about automating games, right? Of just that, right? But so many people get brought in from that and that it gets this kind of a down, look down upon view of it's a it's just a thing for cheating, right? Kind of thing. Um, yet it can do so much more. Yeah, we are, it's hard to say exactly where we are. At one point we were competing so closely with AutoIt on both users and, who's better and who's worse. And we probably couldn't say much about who's better or who, who's worse because for the most part, they're pretty much the same with, uh, on, in, in essence, right? They're, they're both kind of limited to Windows. They have access to Windows at about the same level. Um, and they can both do Dell calls and calm and all that stuff. And most, stuff other than that are usable functions so or user defined functions and sometimes it's a user of our hotkey that first does it and sometimes it's a user of auto it who does it first and for the most part it's it's maybe not straightforward but it's at least convertible so is one better than the other who knows there's a little difference in in how the forums are run and which users are where and well, who you meet first and yeah but but i think we'll both agree the uh the the people using them are very different right in a and one is their capability but but also just on how nice they are right and willing to help um i, I find um, auto hotkey it's amazing right yeah i i, I of course uh, am uh, <laughs> A fan of auto hotkey in that community, but I'm I, I haven't interacted with the auto community in, in years, so I don't really know how they're uh, treating people anymore. But yeah, at one point it seemed like they had um, not an elitist way of treating people, but there was at least a, a more of a more forced way of asking you to try more yeah. first. Right. Uh, where our hot key was a lot of uh, people that were kind of waiting to write code. 
they were had run out of writing code for themselves and wanted to help and the forum was booming with people trying to help so it would could almost be a race to be the first to help someone and that was kind of a fun thing and i'm not sure if it's still that way sometimes but um that in essence does uh, help with newbies to a language um, uh, so people new to our hard key and and i at one point kept counting and we had uh, at least uh, 20 new posts uh, a day from from new users and upwards of 200 new registers a day and that seemed like a lot uh, but again people often come in what do they want oh i want when i press t the mouse should click twice whatever and then they never come back we never hear from them again and they might keep using on hotkey for that small task or they might ever do anything else with stuff like that. So how many users does after hotkey have? It's hard to say and it's hard to build on, right? As you said yourself, Joe, it's it's also a matter of moving yourself into that aspect of is on a hot hotkey developer worth paying? And at some point Python moved into that space. And at one point, AutoIt had it. I don't know if they still have it, but at, at a given point, at least, it was a thing that people put on their LinkedIn profile. I am able to use AutoIt. But now, uh, from what I've heard you say, Joe, it seems that AutoHotKey has now overtaken AutoIt uh, profiles in numbers on no, LinkedIn. Just, no, I don't. I don't. Let's let's do a search here. Um, so auto hotkey on LinkedIn comes back with around almost five thousand, but auto it I think there's a lot more. Yeah, there's a oh, lot yeah. more. The yeah, so so there's still something there. I I couldn't remember precisely, yeah. but it, yeah. But to your point, Jackie, I think the vast majority of people use auto hotkey. They don't think one is. They they may not even be on LinkedIn, right? They're not even that type of person right they're using it for fun or this or that but they don't think like oh i want to make money doing it i'm using it as a hobby versus the auto it people they make sure they emphasize it because it's something that they're in so i don't think that's in the indicative of the number of people using it um it is interesting i, I find it fascinating people don't list it on the resume um, I, I sure do i mean actually if you even look at my my picture i have a you know the icon wrapped in my image um and if we go here, you know what they change? Oh, no, I see. I have over 15,000 first level connections. Not that I have ever automated anything on LinkedIn, because of course that's against their policy. So that, uh, that didn't happen. But um, yeah, I have quite a few first level connections. <laughs> so yeah, you, you can do quite a, a lot. And this was just to kind of show that it depends on also how you, as a language, brand yourself. And, and we've talked about that at length, is that a hotkey name, a good name for a programming language or whatever you want to call it. Um, a lot of people who are new but already have some programming experience might call it um, a prototyping language um, as a definition or something like that. And, it's at least true that you can pretty quickly get from idea to something that works um, and it's reliable enough for you to make something that works well enough for you to also sell it if you wanted to. And there's nothing stopping you from doing that. So you need to just find that thing that others want to pay you for, whatever it might be. And that's probably the hard part. It's probably not that hard when you have learned bits and bits and parts of auto hotkey, but you need a specific amount of reliability. And for that, you probably need something a bit more than image searching. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, but you know, Jackie, I mean, I, I think um, maybe we should have this as another talk and a webinar, but um, the other thing would be, 
is it a program you're giving to someone else versus they want a website scraped or whatever, right? And that's where you're going to do it on your computer and whatever. Hey, you know what? Maybe you're willing to just, you know, make it sloppy, but get it. And I just spend a little more time babies, babying it versus having it so robust that it runs on every computer. Right. And, and so I think that the answer is it depends, right. Of, um, yeah. I, and, and it, to me, it's also that definition of I've used it at my job quite a bit. Uh, so in essence, it's made me money because it's made me more efficient. And by that I've been able to get promoted and get out of jobs and whatever and whatnot. Right. But it, it really depends on how you want to make money with our hotkey to, to want to be able to make that definitive app that you can sell on an app store for a buttload of money or do you want to make the new Google or what is it that you're trying to do? Do you want to make the new UI path? Um, the UI path thing might kind of be possible. I'm not sure if, if we you can move into that space, but you can probably keep out some type of niche in a space like that with a program made and not a hotkey. Yeah, both uh, Jackie and I have, have made significant amount of money with auto hotkey, right? It's yeah, that's that's easy to say. Um and we've done it in different ways and we still do it in different ways even even today. Um I've I was, um, and I was, uh, if anyone has any thoughts on this, I was talking to Maestrith today. Maestrith, he, he's, he's, he, he doesn't do other stuff. So he focuses mostly like in auto hockey. Now he actually develops apps. But I was talking to him and I'm like, the problem is he, he needs, he no longer has an income. So he has to work to make money. And I said, you know, maybe he, he also, he's terrible. Like if you look at his functions and I, and I don't say this in a bad way, uh, in a mean way, but he doesn't annotate like anything, right? He, you, this stuff that is here, most of it's me, it's not him. And there's very little cause I haven't looked at a lot of the code, but um, I was talking to him about it and going, you know, maybe what we should do is you, you keep developing and make cool stuff. Um, I will go in and I'll document it and record videos explaining how to use it but we'll put it behind some sort of a membership library where him and I can both get some money. And that way he makes some money to actually spend his time doing what he loves. Um, I, I don't, I like actually, I, I, I want to make some money too, but I like the fact that other people are going to use it. I, I hate that he creates stuff and he'll even share it, but because he doesn't explain it well, people end up not using it. And yet he, he makes some really amazing stuff. So we were we were knocking that around. I don't know if I was anyone has any thoughts about what would you pay, you know, for access to a library of of scripts? Because the problem is, of course, again, when you you know you make it available, what's to stop people from really sharing it on somewhere else and sending it to everyone in the world without a hotkey, right? So it makes it really hard. So, um, but yeah, I, I, getting back to, I think he could be one of those people that can make some cool tools that would level up auto hotkey yet at the same time, there's virtually no incentive to do it and to share it um, because it's, you know, it, it's just so easy to rip off or not. I shouldn't say rip off. It's just, it's tough. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like we had the other one on, on protecting your intellectual property, right. which I know is linked to on the forum as well. And it, it, it's a lot of different, aspects to all of that stuff and uh, sure when you get to a specific level and when you then end up in a, in in the situation as uh, chad where he has become quite good at writing both auto hotkey and, and and a few other things as well how to utilize it how is he gonna make an income off of it and without a hotkey if he doesn't get that definitive idea that other people are going to pay him for something like what you explained could probably be a thing it could also be let's say you have access to it for six months before everybody else and then we'll Ooh. release it or whatever it might be and the thing that people really get access to is the documentation the videos the support or whatever it might be something like that um and robert was asking if if there's obfuscation i think robert asked that question too um 
but but for this, like we're going to build code that we want to let other auto hotkey programmers use and tweak, right? And that's where like we wouldn't want to obfuscate that. Now, if we were writing a completely sealed program, that's one thing, right? Like automate this, uh, automate my task. I could have compiled the whole thing and, and, and shared that and that would have locked it down. Maybe I should still do that because while I'm happy to share this, um, I'm, I'm not, I don't want it shared in the forum um, or I want to make sure we at least leave the links to my site because I paid Maestri with a fair amount of money to develop this and, um, and I want to you know, get traffic. I don't mind sharing and people using it and using your code. Just make sure you leave the citations in there, right? But what I could have done on this tool in particular is I could compile it and share just the compiled version. Um, and then, you know, then I could obfuscate it and do that stuff and it still would dump out the code. So that way people don't peek inside of it, yet they get the code they need for writing their syntax. So that is something I could do on this one. But I was thinking more, he creates some really cool stuff that you would, there, it's not the, the tool itself. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we could create more stuff for writing auto hockey syntax because that's the things I love. Maybe you guys have, like if I launch, this is my web scraping syntax writer, right? And so here, this, if I, I don't want to dump it in here. Um, oops, so pointer create, let's say I want to get the window, oops, and something went wrong, of course. Pointer create IE object. So it dumps in my auto hotkey code into whatever editor I'm in right? So it's things like that, that to me, I love writing it because it allows me to not have to memorize how to type all this stuff out, right? I have my templates I can use quickly. And stuff like this, of course, becomes a little bit more worth something. Um, the more people that are writing out of hotkey every day, mm -hmm. and the less of them that expects everything in out of hotkey to be free. I know that we made a Udemy course at one point and, and yep. or mostly you made it and you have made a next one. And it, it's a great resource. And I do understand why when you use that many hours on making videos and researching and stuff, uh, why you would want people to pay a small fee for going through that. And that's something the Autohotkey community does not have, and I'm not sure where the line on paid and not paid should be, mm -hmm. because in the language itself, libraries and stuff like that should probably be open source within reason, but the tools build with the language for specific tasks. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? So if you made a big library, a GUI library, as you said, or, or as Mathjet did, Right. Um, then that could be released within the community for others to benefit from when making these. But if you then made a great tool with a GUI, then that could be a paid thing. There's nobody forcing anybody to keep that as a free thing for whatever it might be. If it's for scraping a specific type of website if it's for automating a task on whatever, LinkedIn or whoever knows, Facebook, whatever it could be. There's, there's nothing really stopping anybody from compiling that to the best of their ability because it doesn't seem as if any real compilation is totally safe. But I know that the auto hotkey H has a method and uh, Feiyu, the, the guy who made fine text, also made uh, a pretty good compiler that will keep, keep your code pretty safe. Um, both of these methods are within reason, not yet decompilable. Some people might still be able to decompile them, but within reason, your stuff is safe. Uh, stuff in C, stuff in C++, stuff in C Sharp, that's also only reasonably safe. It's still decompilable and everything is written in that stuff, right? It's, it's not like whatever you have here on Windows, um, that's not open source, but you can find pretty much anything 
of how stuff in Windows is done. So again, it, it really depends on how good your idea is and where how how far along you are with it. Um, if if you get the right tool, people will for the most part be willing to pay the price of what it costs. And then there will be a small amount of pirates or code breakers or whatever that will either do it for the challenge or just because they want everything to be free or whatever it might be. But it shouldn't really be anything that hits you over the head financially within reason, of course. <laughs>